This week's episode is made possible by our friends at Independent Bank. You can learn more about them at i-bankonline.com. Good morning, Memphis. You are listening to Meanwhile in Memphis on WYXR Radio 91.7 FM. Meanwhile in Memphis, this radio show and podcast on WYXR is brought to you by us, New Memphis. We are a local leadership development nonprofit whose mission is to develop, activate, and retain talent to Memphis. Um, Something I'm really, really excited about is that TEDx Memphis 2023 is just right around the corner on February 11th. TEDx Memphis will be held at Crosstown Theater, and this year's theme is Truth or Dare. You can head over to newmemphis.org or TEDx-Memphis.com for more information and to purchase your tickets. Um, Our guest today was actually a TEDx Memphis speaker back in 2015, the first year that we brought the TED conference to Memphis. And before I get too much further into it, I want to introduce my wonderful co-host for today. Say hello, hello. Hello, I am Raquel. I am the Director of Partnerships and Advancement for New Memphis, and I'm thrilled to be here. You're also a former radio show and podcaster, right? I am. Yeah. So, I don't tell people about that, but I am. Yeah, so her, her silky voice um, will be lovely for you today, dear listener. Um, so a little bit about our guest. We will be interviewing Melissa anderson Sweezy today. She is the creative director at Running Pony. She is also an award-winning screenwriter, film, and music video director, essayist, photographer, and mother living in Memphis, Tennessee, right here in the 901. She is the recipient of many awards and grants, as I previously mentioned, and she's directed many, many films, including one of the main reasons that we invited her to join us today. The film Ready, Fire, Aim, and Kimmins Wilson debuted at the 2022 Indie Memphis Film Festival, and we are extraordinarily excited to hear about the film, all that went into it, plus all of her many ventures and what she's got on the horizon. So you do not want to miss this. I would ask that if you like what you hear today, you would hit the subscribe button on your podcast and shoot us any feedback over at info at newmemphis.org. So without further ado, here is our conversation with Melissa. Welcome, Melissa. How are you doing this morning? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm good. Good. And we're so glad to have you. Thank you for making time in your busy schedule to join us today. Um, I'm going to start off and just say, can you tell our listening audience a little bit about yourself? Are you a native Memphian? I am. uh, Born, raised uh, Memphian. And yeah, um, I had a brief, brief sojourn in Los Angeles um, for about nine years, but then have been back pretty much since then. I love it. I love to uh, love to hear it, that you are a native Memphian, but also a chosen Memphian. Yes. Love it. So um, how did you, were you always interested in the arts? How did you kind of start to create that path for yourself about you know, screenwriting, directing, writing, sure. all of it? How did yeah. you kind of decide that that was your path? I, I don't, I mean, this going to sound out there, but I, I feel like it's one of the things that was decided for me. I mean, I, I think I've just been a storyteller since I, since I arrived. Um, I was the stereotype of the, the bossy kid getting the neighborhood kids together to be in plays that I would write and direct and sometimes star in very megalomaniacal. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, I've just always have been looking Story's just always, it's always been there. It's always been a key part of me, who I am, how I think. Um, you know, it's it's art, but also it's just, it's a way of life for me. So you said stories kind of are everywhere. So have you, like when you were a child, what kind of stories would you like write about? What, what kind of things have always kind of caught your eye to create those kind of through lines? So um, I think anybody who knows me, this isn't surprising, but I, I think I've just always been drawn to darker stories. Um, <laughs> you I think, don't say. <laughs> right. Well, I think maybe, I think probably fairy tales being kind of the entry point and then getting into origin stories of fairy tales. Grimm's, that, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Grimm's you know, yeah. it's darker cautionary tales and... Um, I mean, of all places, uh, the church that I grew up in when I was very young had a copy of the Bell Witch in their library, um, which is for anybody who doesn't know, it's the, it's 
kind of one of the oldest ghost stories in America, and it's considered one of the kind of oldest poltergeist stories. And it's a murder mystery. And so I was 10 and I was hooked. Oh my you gosh. know, I was living in a very comfortable, safe, but also kind of boring suburban upbringing. And I think that idea of danger and magic and mystery that there's something around the corner has just, that's always been um, appealing to me and it just never stopped. So yeah, it's kind of a long way of saying that if it's, if it's dark, it's creepy, it's mysterious, that's, I'm, I'm moving towards that, not away. I see. So if you saw Woods as a child, you were immediately like, there's a story there. Oh, for sure. Yes. Yeah. Something deep, dark, and magical is happening in those woods. Absolutely. Okay. So this would be a great segue into your podcast. Would you like to share with our listening audience a little bit about the podcast? Yes, I would love to. Um, it's um, really just kind of a happy accident. Um I'm a sucker for a good ghost story. Um, my my day job, um, I work at uh, a production company in Memphis, and Nate Reisman, who is the audio engineer, um, there's a lot of waiting around setting up for shoots, and so he and I would start trading off ghost stories. And after a while, we were like, you know, maybe, maybe we should do this. And that was, I mean, I think maybe almost five years ago. Um, wow. So we have we have a podcast called You Can See Me in the Dark. And it is listened to in every continent except Antarctica. We're very proud of that. <laughs> we have a global, global audience. And if you are in Antarctica hearing this, that's my, I'm trying to manifest this. If yes. there is some researcher in a research station binging podcast, they need to listen to ours. Um, Any ghosts that have access to that, just tune in. Yeah. And, and <laughs> to share your story. Yeah. And, and that's what we do. We, we basically, we find and curate ghost stories from all over the world. And we have the person who experienced it tell the story. Because to me, there's just nothing better. It's that kind of sitting around the campfire telling a ghost story, but the person who actually like lived through it and then gets to tell you the story. Gosh, I have like chill bumps. Yeah. It's, it's not just truly one of the creepiest is. things I've listened like, <laughs> to. And some that's a compliment, Melissa. No, it is. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, there have been some episodes where I'm like, I will not sleep tonight if I don't stop right now. So I'm going to have to revisit this later. So. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, yeah. It's, um, it has been, I will say one of the like true delights of my life to be on a Zoom with um, just somebody somewhere in the world who's telling me a ghost story. Um, that actually happened to them. That actually happened to them. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's, been, it's been so fun and fascinating. Oh, wow. That's wild. Okay, so switching mm -hmm. gears <laughs> from ghost stories <laughs> to one of the main reasons that we <clears throat> invited you here to speak with us today um, is about Ready, Fire, Aim. Am I saying that right? And Kevin yeah. Wilson. Yeah. Okay, so talk to me about this film. It debuted at Indie Memphis in the fall, correct? It did. It did. Okay, so talk to me about the film and sure. the origin story for the film. Sure. Um, well, I guess backing up a little bit. Um, so in addition to um, writing and directing um, things that I've written, um, I also have a background in documentary film. Um, and I've um, have produced and directed um, a number of feature documentaries, um, but this one um, it's it was special for a number of reasons. But I think first and foremost, I'm I'm a sucker for origin stories. Um, I love to know the, the kind of behind the scenes. Why did this become a thing? And um, especially for for Memphians, it's like we have this um, kind of special. In a way, it's almost a secret because I feel like a lot of people don't understand that Holiday Inn was a big deal. Um, mm -hmm. Holiday Inn is now global. It's everywhere. It's part of our culture. We don't think twice about it. And to me, that's the genius of it is that there had to be somebody who dreamed all that up. When you go into a hotel room, um, there is a reason that it is the size that it is, that there is an ice machine, that there is a restaurant, that that there is standardization because back in the day you'd go on a trip with your family and you'd have to like mom or dad would have to get out and go in, talk with the innkeeper and scout and make sure, was it clean? Did it have towels? Did it, you know, was it going to be safe? And that's, that's for the Wilson family. That was their origin story. You know, Kimmins Wilson was a serial entrepreneur, had all these amazing ideas. Some, 
took off. Some didn't. But As with any serial it, entrepreneur, exactly, yes, you keep going. Exactly. And so he um, he took his family on this um, now very fateful vacation where he had five kids and they went in and spent the night. And the next morning, he they went to check out and the, the innkeeper billed him her kid. And <gasps> Kimmons was furious because he's like, that's not what I agreed to. And legend has it in that moment, he was like, I am going to build a hotel and not just one. I'm going to build a, like, I think now I'm forgetting the number. I'm going to build hundreds of hotels across the country. I'm going to standardize the, you know, the chain of hotels. And write this wrong. Exactly. Exactly. Because they're, I think maybe some people had the idea, but he actually followed through. Like in just an unbelievable, in an unbelievable way he did. He accomplished this incredible goal. And now we have him to thank for pools at the hotel and a restaurant because he knows, you know, people travel with their kids. Like yeah. parents everywhere. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was supposed to say, literally. <laughs> exactly. Um, so we have that. We have Kemmons to thank for that standardization. That's really exciting. Like you said, I love to see the global impact of a Memphian, mm-hmm. but also that origin story of like, let's make sure that people tie Memphis together with this Memphian that exactly. created this global brand. Exactly. Well, and I think it's so interesting that like the hospitality industry in Memphis has always tried to stay close to that root of Kevin's Wilson's story. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we have the university of Memphis has that school, the school of hospitality for the Kevin's Wilson, you know, we, I drive by it every day and, um, you know, it, it is that reminder that wherever you are in the world, there is a, a link to Memphis because of Kimmons Wilson. Very much so. And he, I think he instilled that in each of his five kids um, because his, all his adult children um, chose to stay here in Memphis and continue to give back. Um, deeply, deeply philanthropical family. Um, I don't know if philanthropical is actually a word. Philanthropic? We're going to claim it. We're okay, also going to manifest that. <laughs> We're Just all like philanthropical. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but they, um, just very much dedicated to, um, improving and seeing the potential in the city in which they live. Um, they, the Wilson family has just, is given a lot to Memphis. Um, and, and also it was personal for me because, uh, Kimmons, um, his daughter-in-law is my aunt. So there was a, a family connection here because I, I grew up, you know, not I'm not I'm not a Wilson, um, but I grew up on you know getting to observe the Wilson family, and I got to meet Kimmons, and and I remember seeing him outside a movie theater because also movie theaters was a he he owned um, a variety of movie theaters in Memphis because cinema was huge. That's why the big the great sign out of Holiday Inn with the big marquee lights. That's because mm-hmm. of his fascination with movies and owning movie theaters. But I met Kimmons. And I was maybe 10 years old and he came up to me and he handed me what was his calling card, which was like at the time, like a trillion dollar bill with his space on it. Like he had his own <laughs> currency. And I was like, who is this guy? Um, because I just thought like he just had this like light in his eyes. There was just this kind of impish delight to him. He just seemed to be moving through the world delighted. And that made an impression on me at age 10. So it was it was so cool for me, um, you know, having already done documentary films and being fascinated and learning the, the backstory to be given this opportunity to help tell his story. Because um, it's a cool personal story, but it's a story that impacts so many Memphians. So that means that uh, our New Memphis's good friend, Rebecca, and producer of the film is your cousin. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. I love, you know, people talk about how small Memphis is. Yes. Um, and, and it's not a small city, but you know, the six degrees of yeah, separation of separation for, yeah. is so, I mean, like I, I was literally talking to Rebecca last week and, you Aww. know, we, um, when you talked about how instilling that message of giving back to your community, mm-hmm. staying in your community, mm-hmm. um, you know, I've had the privilege of working with and chatting with so many members of the Wilson family in my work here at New Memphis. And it is very clear, um, how important it is not only to stay here and build businesses and that, you know, entrepreneurial spirit continues on after generation and generation, but, um, 
but just that that philanthropic philanthropical philanthropical that's right <laughs> bless y'all uh, excuse me um it's, how dare you it's very clear that that has um has persisted yeah um so that's I I didn't know uh, Melissa and I've known each other for for years but I did not know that Becky was your aunt yes she is that's so fun. Um, I have also been uh, a, I guess, recipient of the generosity and the philanthropicalness. Of the, <laughs> we're just going to keep know, adding. Gonna yeah. It's going to be like the longest word. Um, <laughs> but the Kimmins Wilson Center for Good Grief. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, ha- I utilized their services and it was wonderful. And I sincerely appreciate that that is something that was thought about before I needed the service. Mm-hmm. And so that is just one of the many kind of limbs of that tree of the way that they're caring about the community and kind of stepping in to fill those gaps. And so it is very exciting to and, see. And you directed the Good Grief film, didn't I did. you? I did. Um, and yeah, and that was, again, speaking to just the Wilson family, but also how small Memphis is. Um, I had a neighbor who reached out to me because um, she had seen my TED talk and she didn't realize that I was a filmmaker. And she was currently at the time she was heavily involved with um, the Kimmins Wilson Center for Good Grief and said, you know, we really would like to um, educate more people in Memphis about because it's the kind of place that you typically don't know about until, until you need it, until you need mm-hmm. it. Um, and it it was such a, a privilege to be able to spend time at the center and get to tell that story um, and get to just sit with, cause they have, you know, they have camps for kids of all ages, but we, we get to spend, you know, go to the camp and spend time with the kids. And it was, um, it was, it was phenomenal. It really was. And that neighbor reached out, not knowing your connection to the Wilson she, family. She did. Okay, she I was did. like, that is that's that's too, yeah. that would have been <laughs> too much. crazy. Um, but uh, no, I I run the the five k every year. The mm, yeah, the, mm-hmm. the five, I, that's that's one of my favorite, and it's you know not because of the race, but because of the families, and you know, there's always a bunch of kids, and they're mm-hmm. always you know you can see that they're they're grateful for the community that they've built within the Kimmins Wilson Center. Yeah. Absolutely. And to your point, a lot of people may not know about it, mm-hmm. um, but it is there if and when anybody ever needs it. Because um, in another TED Talk that I've uh, watched on repeat when I was going through my grief, uh, the science will show that everyone you love has a 100% chance of dying. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it was just like, oh, you know, it, it's a fact. And so knowing that that service is there even if you don't think about it day to day, mm-hmm. it's when you do need it, it's a tremendous asset to our city. So I'm excited to know what was the process like? You were interested in origin stories. You had um, the movie connection. You were interested in documentaries, but you were also had a slight family connection. What was it like to kind of direct this? What did it mean to you to like to be the one that was at the helm? Oh, well, it was um, – I had – it was an enormous sense of responsibility um, to be entrusted with his story. Um, I felt privileged that the family considered me because um, I know that they they had explored uh, different routes. Um, because I think at the time the the founder that's the the biopic about the McDonald's, yes, effect, mm. which is yes, I mean apples and oranges because the there's a very different story yeah not it's not a flattering <laughs> yeah I was about story to say, about eat. an entrepreneur <laughs> yeah but the fact that you know there were there was in, there was clearly interest in um that type of origin yes, story in hearing yeah. those kinds of origin stories and so that I think initially the family was like oh you know what this this he does have a great story and they and ultimately it it, it came they entrusted it with me um and that that was exciting and I, I work at Running Pony, which is a production company in Memphis. And so we took it um, through the company. So that way I had access to um, wonderful uh, DPs, directors of photography and editors and worked with them to put the story together. And then I had a um, a woman that I connected with who is an expert in archival footage because so Ooh, much of this story, wow. you know, was having to track down the old commercials, um, just kind of lifestyle, um, just kind of the ephemera of the 50s and 60s kind of during Kimmins' heyday. So that was a bit of a 
beast um, just to, to sift yeah. through all of that information. But it was exciting because we found, you know, his interview with Merv Griffin. Um, there was a, wow. one of the clips in the movie is um, Elton John singing a song um, about the Holiday Inn. And then what... <laughs> It took way too much time, um, but I'm thrilled that the the Wilsons were excited about it. And ultimately, I know audiences responded to it. The film opens with the last shot of Poltergeist. And, of course it does, again, man. It's you. Of course it does, because it's me. Because I coincidentally, in the process of making the movie, um, Poltergeist was on. It's one of my favorite movies. And I was watching it, and I had never noticed this before, that the last shot of the movie is the family who is, they've, you know, they've escaped the house, they've escaped the ghosts, they are exhausted, and they're battered, and they you see them, like, dragging themselves into a hotel and there's this shot and behind the family is the great sign <gasps> they are at holiday inn and i was like oh my god that's how we open the movie because what better way to show the global impact of holiday inn that here's a family that has survived the worst encounter of their life and where do we where do they go for safety and security and peace of mind holiday inn that's amazing. Yeah, that's good storytelling. For I mean, sure. truly, it really is. But also that you were watching it while you were in that. I, I mean, know. but it just just does solidify the impact of the brand, yeah. and that the directors of Poltergeist were like, "This is where they have to be." Exactly. Absolutely, that's where the family is going to go when yeah. they escape. Where else would they go? Right. <laughs> I'm like this all American family is just going to mm-hmm. show up there. Yep, I love it. So. The film, as Anna said, debuted at ND Memphis. What what led you to the decision to have it debut there versus Oh well, I mean it's it's a no brain. I mean it's a Memphis story. For sure. Um it, it's a Memphis story and and I have to say what an unexpected um byproduct slash delight of premiering it at ND Memphis was sitting in the room and after the movie was over you know, typically at a screening, there's a Q&A and it became less about people asking questions about the movie, more people sharing their stories about their relationship to Kim and Wilson. Um, like when I had I put stuff on social media about the upcoming screening mm-hmm. and I had people saying like people coming out of the woodwork to be like, you know, my aunt worked there or my grandfather was friends with Kimmins. And they were all positive stories, which was, you know, just the icing on the cake. You know, people who felt the need to share that they, they'd they had a relationship or an encounter and they felt delighted to share that story. So that, that was so neat for me and for Rebecca, um, you know, getting to stand up there in front of all these people and people just being so excited to be like, we love Kimmins. We, I loved working there. Or I heard family stories about, you know, our family working there. Cause it is, it's just such, it's such a part of the Memphis story being involved with Holiday Inn. I love it. Um, other than the poltergeist scene, what is an unexpected delight that you found in creating the film? Mm. Um, I think there is there is a lot of lip service and and understandably so about the the myth of of bootstraps. Because the Americans, you know, that's that is our America collective American origin story is it's all these self-made, self-determined um, millionaires or success stories. And and often you find out when you really dig into it, it's like, oh, no, this person had advantages or they had help. And he I mean, sure, he's a white man. So he's a white man in America. So there's going to be those advantages. But he truly was the definition of the pull yourself up by your bootstraps because no one's coming to save you. Um, you know, he, I think he was like so many people of his generation, you know, there's the great depression wars. Um, he lost his father when he was a baby. So he had a single mom. It was hard, but, um, there was a lot of people who had that situation, but not everybody was Kimmins. And I think it was, it was really, um, 
it it was it was incredible for me to just read all of these stories and just get a very clear eyed view of what an incredible person this was. He really is kind of a once in a lifetime genius entrepreneur. And I don't say that word lightly. So having heard of Kimmins, knowing Kimmins briefly, meeting Kimmins in my life, and then getting to make this movie and seeing like, oh, it's real. Like it's, it's not just family myth or lore or, you know, mm-hmm. kind of trumped up. Like he's, he's legit. Um, he, he just, as I say, had this kind of supernatural ability um, for hustle and follow through that God, I mean, I feel like if I had like just a, an iota of that, like how <laughs> successful could I be if I had his stamina? Um, so that so that was cool just to see, you know, just finding evidence over and over again that that he was a real deal, all while having five children. Yeah, uh-huh. well, I mean, that's, that's important. You bring that up because that is an important part of his story, and it was an important part for the Wilson family. To be clear that behind every man is a successful woman. And Dorothy um, was a powerhouse in her own right because Kimmins was an only child and Kimmins longed to have this huge family, but it takes work. That is a lot of work. That is unpaid labor (laughs) um, of having to maintain five children and all of those kids worship their mother like the saint that she was. In fact, that's probably one of my favorite moments in the movie that unprompted all of her kids at one point said she was a saint. (laughs) And so that was a really cute montage that we have of all of the kids saying as much. As all three of us are moms sitting at this table, I think we can all only hope that when our children are grown, <laughs> that's what they're, I mean, my kids are not going to say that. But I was about to say, yeah. I'm thinking of all the reasons why they wouldn't say right. that about uh, me. But at the same time, I'm like, that just goes to show like the but hard work yeah. and all the love that was obviously there. Yeah, But that's so lovely too that, I mean, like you said, you know, the, even in the story of Kimmins Wilson, that the acknowledgement mm-hmm. of the partnership that had to be built between him and Dorothy to, to build this great, what is now the myth, the legend, um, that he didn't do it alone, even though he did, he was self-made, but he wasn't alone, um, is I think, a an interesting distinction because so yeah. often the wife or the partner is left out of that story. Mm-hmm. Or um, it's just not a lovely story. As you or mentioned, yes. the founder. <laughs> yeah. It was not a lovely uh, portrayal. It was no. a partnership in that way. It was not, not flattering. Yeah. Um, but not, speaking not of parenthood, that is a lovely segue to your 2015 TED Talk. So you were an inaugural TED Talk speaker here mm-hmm. in Memphis. And the title of your talk is If You Love Them, Let Them Go. When you become a parent, people like to give you things. Parenting books that worked for them. Baby showers, where sometimes you get diapers in the shape of a cake. And advice, lots and lots of unsolicited advice. Because if you think about it, not many of us will become experts in our chosen field. But when you become a parent, you become an expert in your particular field of baby, in the minutia that makes your toddler a toddler. And after months and years of such intimate, specialized study, we all start to feel rather qualified to weigh in on any host of issues that deal with parenting children, and by extension, your children. It's why the mom at Target knows better than you why your kid is crying, or how teething can explain fever, rash, drool, stool, and Greece's economic collapse. <laughs> oh. But it's, it's why I'm here today, the expert on my two kids, here to give you some unsolicited advice on if you really love your children, you'll listen to the real experts who are telling us to give them some space because their mental health just may depend on it. But some background first. Um, In addition to being a mother, I'm a writer, and I like to make movies on the things that I write. And like a lot of writers, I ascribe to the write what you know adage. So it's 2012, I'm a frustrated artist and mother of two very young children. So what did I know? 
I knew that I had never been more exhausted, more depressed, more isolated, confused, deeply in love, and terrified to take on the most important role that I'll ever have. Um, you fellow experts in the room know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, seemingly overnight, you're handed this brand new, tiny human being who is completely dependent upon hormonal erect, sleep deprived you for its daily survival. <laughs> and your job is to grow them so that they'll go. And <laughs> at this stage of the game, you know, this sounds insane because they were in your body and now they're on your body and they're gonna have driver's licenses and go far away from you. Though sometimes you are more than ready for them to go far away. <laughs> Sometimes you will have a dream of opening a toddler boarding school in Latvia, and this will not sound crazy when you say this to a room full of people. Um, so how do you deal with all these competing feelings and emotions and material to write what you know as a new parent? Well, if you're me, you procrastinate and you go on the internet. And Normally this is a bad idea, but I stumbled onto an article that profoundly changed the way that I see things as a parent. It was written by David Derbyshire, and it talked about how in four generations, our children have lost their right to roam. So 100 years ago, the outermost circle on the map, an eight-year-old child had six miles to roam unsupervised. Now, his son had a similar radius. You get to the 80s, his daughter had close to two miles, but you get to the present day. 2015, the bullseye on the map. This eight-year-old child has less than 300 yards to explore by themselves. Now, this map took my breath away because as parents, we want to give our kids the best of our childhoods, and my childhood was not the bullseye on the map. When I was a kid, I roamed in packs. I explored my neighborhood and beyond. I played in the woods, I built forts, I caught frogs. I went home when the streetlights came on. And I firmly believe it's this time period that I started to fall in love with the idea of storytelling. So this bullseye stands as the antithesis to my childhood and a warning about my children's future. See, there's this thing published every year called the World Happiness Report. And it's always these Nordic and Danish countries that come out on top every year. And the reason that they do so well is because they consistently rank in the category of personal freedom. And what this means in part is that they are willing to give their children far more space to explore their independence than we're willing to do. The United States, we rank 15th on the World Happiness Report below Mexico. So if I was on track to be ruining my children's childhood um, by not letting them get out of the bullseye, well, at least I should get a movie out of it. <laughs> and I did, I made a movie about it and it's called John's Farm and it could just as easily be called Sympathy for the Helicopter Parent. And it's, it's about us. It's a parable about a very nervous dad who knows how terrifying the world can be, but he wants to do the right thing. So he brings his kid to this massive property for an epic free-range play date, but there's a catch. Once the kids are led across the bridge, no adult is allowed to follow. If they do, it's a $1,000 fine, and not just that parent, but every parent present is barred from returning. So it's an incredibly strict social contract set in place to protect the parent from himself. So, spoiler alert, dad crosses the bridge. And it's not the fine or the threat of expulsion that is his undoing, it's, it's this. I am the official king of the hill. So my takeaway was, don't be that dad. Because <laughs> um, you see what you stand to lose. 
So I felt good about the message. The movie was over, so it was time for me to do more research and go online. Um, but when I did, I, I saw this. And then I read this. And this, you know, seemingly once a week there was news about a parent getting arrested for letting their children walk to the park. And one of the mothers in question said, I just want to give them the same freedom and independence that I had. The only thing that's changed between then and now is our fear. So here's the rub. We are living in what some have deemed the safest time to be alive in history, but I think possibly the hardest time to be a parent. We no longer raise children in villages, we raise them from behind computer screens. And neighbors have become strangers, and strangers on social media make us feel terrible about our choices. As experts in our fields, I think we can agree on one thing, and that's we're just making it up as we go along, right? And, and sometimes the most gratifying thing in the world is to take down the one parent you feel is doing a worse job than you are. So if we're to raise the kind of children to become confident and happy and rank highest on the World Happiness Report, we have to give them the physical freedom to develop these skills, but our fear is sending a very different message. Dr. Brené Brown says, if we're always following our children into the arena, hushing the critics and assuring their victory, they'll never learn that they have the ability to dare greatly on their own. So she's the expert. So what about this expert up here? I can tell you all to let your children go, just as I have the same thoughts as you when I hear that story about the boy abducted on his way home from school, the little girl that disappeared on the way to the bus stop. You know, who wants to take that kind of risk when the consequences are unthinkable? The experts tell us statistics are on our side, but what if it's my kid? What if? And what about me? What about the mom who felt so strongly that our kid should have the right to roam, that she went and made a movie about it, but still won't let her own eight-year-old daughter out of the bullseye. I got a text from my friend Sarah. She's a true free-range parent who lives in my neighborhood, wanting to know if her daughter could walk my daughter home, the long four blocks unsupervised. And I said yes. I went outside with my son, currently home from boarding school, to wait. <laughs> and I tried not to obsess or call her back in a fit of panic. And what seemed like 10 lifetimes later, there she was. She didn't see me. And amazingly, another friend had joined them. And they crossed the street and ran right from my neighbor's sprinkler. And all of a sudden, there was my childhood and there was her childhood looking remarkably the same. Thank you. That was Melissa Anderson Sweezy's 2015 TEDx Memphis talk titled, If You Love Them, Let Them Go. And I found it completely enlightening. I was not a mother in 2015. I am a mother in 2023. And so I think every time I've watched it, I've gleaned different insights. What gave you the idea to say, it's got to be this? This is what if I'm going to have some time on this stage, this is what it's got to be about. Oh, sure. Um, well, I, I mean, I was, I was thrilled and terrified. <laughs> I mean, I will be real. I was terrified to have the opportunity. I had an eye twitch that I think it took a year to go away from just the stress <laughs> over preparing because they really, really prepare you. It's a um, unique experience. It is. It's not just any other, you know, speaking engagement. No, no. Um, and, and so, I mean, some of it was, was selfish and self promotional because I, you know, at, at the time I was, was really steeped in making a lot of short films and the, the very first short film that I made was very close to my heart. And it, and it definitely ties back to what we were saying earlier with my own origin story about fairy tales. And I had written a short 
uh, and directed it called John's Farm. And it really spoke to me um, about just the, at the time, which I think is still very much a thing, just this, um, the anxiety of, of parenting with with social media, with always be feeling like you're being judged, um, and and feeling like you can't make a mistake because there was always a blog or there was always you were seeing all these examples of what was right and what was wrong. You know, there was at the time there was um, there was a, a mother who had let her. I think maybe he was nine years old, let her nine-year-old son in New York take take the subway by himself. And she was arrested. And that was horrifying to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Because, I mean, it's it's hard enough just being a parent. Yes, Um, as we've already, yes, yes, (laughs) established. Yes. I mean, then that's probably, I mean, I would say that my body of work, I mean, that's probably the theme is that parenting is hard. I mean, that is, that's the through line for all of my work. And... And, and but seeing in real life, you know, people being arrested for accidentally leaving their kid in the car or, or running in to grab something and leaving their kid in the car and there's police have been called. I mean, just judgment, 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 judgment. And, and so then that gives birth to the helicopter parent, because now you have all this, you have all this information about how to parent, how not to parent. And there's still there's a bazillion books, but there's no book that tells there's you no really, authoritative yeah, there's yeah. not and then there's all this fear like you said from the judgment right. like wait a second now i can be arrested for sending my kid right. down the street to right. play in the park or what yeah. else? then it's like okay well then now i have no other choice yeah. now, you, now you've forced my hand exactly I must be there exactly and and i had seen um uh, or read a statistic about the freedom that children were granted a hundred years prior and it was I, and I, it was a map that it showed the radius that kids like age seven, the access that they were given to roam. And slowly over time, that that acreage, that territory has slowly been whittled down to when I made the movie in, I think, 2012, 2013, was that kids are basically allowed to go to the end of their driveway. Yeah, uh, it's like 300 yards yeah. max. That's and n- that's n- and that yeah. and that was that was not how I grew up. I mean, I grew up, um, and granted, it was still you know I was growing up in a in a, a safe suburb that was being developed, and so we would go off into what we called the woods, you know, where there's a new <laughs> suburb being you know being built at yes. the time. But I felt you know I didn't have there weren't phones. There wasn't a way for parents to track you. And I think this is the first generation where. Everyone is trackable. You're, you know, it's, you're always being watched. I hate to, I don't want to say like surveillance state, but that's kind of how it feels. And so all that to be said is that how do we parent in a way um, that understanding that there is, you cannot at the end of the day, keep your children safe. There is no guarantee or no promise. You follow all of these steps, you the right schools or the right suburb, the right neighborhood, there is no guarantee at the end of the day that they're going to be safe. And that is the terror of being a parent, (laughs) but that is the job of being a parent. And, and so I think in my convoluted way of talking about the movie and these statistics and about, um, the happiness, um, survey that was talking about, you know, happy countries and, and finding that people that self reported like the highest amount of happiness had freedom. They were not felt like they were being regulated and oppressed and judged. And so it's trying to to reeducate ourselves as adults. How do we give our kids the freedom to just go go? And be curious and imagine exactly. and play yeah. and yeah. I I recently, well, within the last couple of years, my two older children who are now 10 and 14, I made the decision that I was not going to um, censor what they read, the books that they read. Um, they both read well above grade level. It was always really hard to find age appropriate, uh, so to speak, things for them to read. And so, you know, we had a conversation and I said, if you read something that you think is inappropriate for you, I hope you'll come have a, I hope you'll come talk to me about it. I hope you'll help let me help you explore these feelings or the confusion or answer any questions, but I'm not going to censor what you read. Um, and I hope you make good decisions. And, uh, 
the horror when I tell people, you know, people will say, oh, Amelia's reading my daughter. She, she's reading this, you know, whatever it is. She's, you know, she was reading, uh, you know, dystopian YA or whatever. And I'm like, oh, yeah, she she likes that. Or she's reading a book about vampires or she's actually when you were talking about your 10 year old self wanting to be creeped out and, you know, fairy tales. That's exactly my daughter. And uh, people are horrified, though, you know, and it's and it's not even she's in her room. But, you know, but I'm not even the 300 yards has been met. But um, but people, you know, there is so much judgment mm -hmm. in in every parenting decision you make. And um, I I enjoyed. You know, I rewatched your TED talk recently um, and it was almost like a like a touchstone to say, like, I'm not the only one that doesn't want to hover over my children and make them shrink under mm -hmm. my weight and mm -hmm. my shadow. Um, so as a, as a mom, I appreciated it. I agree. Okay. Um, and something you mentioned just now is that like some of the best parenting advice I feel like I ever got was prepare the child for the path, not the path for the child. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, that's the truth. You've got to equip your child to be able to be like, Hey, this book is, or is not correct for me. I've got to, or if it isn't, I've got to navigate that. And instead of always knowing that someone else can come bail me out. Of and, that. Yeah. and it leads to such great conversations. You know, I what mom, I'm scared. I mm -hmm. don't want to finish this. That's okay. You know, and then, and then you get to talk to your kid about it, which is, you know, and my, my, especially my older two kids, they're finally at the age where we have like such fun conversations and it's, it's delightful. So that's fun to me too. Um, so you said the through line might be of, of all of your work might be, um, that parenting is hard, mm -hmm. but, I'm curious to know about what it is like. You've been in LA, mm -hmm. you've been here in Memphis. What is some of the differences, some of the pros of being, of creating films in Memphis? Sure. No um, matter what the through line is. Yeah. Um, I'd say it's, matter. it's access. Um, because, and, and I've, I've told this story before, but you know, when I, when I, I moved to Los Angeles, um, like, week that I graduated. I stayed in college. I stayed in Memphis for college. I went to Rhodes, graduated, and I was never coming back to Memphis. It was very clear about never coming back to Memphis. And I came back to Memphis and I thought, well, that's it. You know, I don't, I failed. I don't get to be a filmmaker. I don't get to live my dreams. And and then, you know, and I was a new mom. There was a lot that I was working through. And then I kind of through my stupor kind of looked up. And then I was like, wait a second. Like, there's actually a lot happening here. Um, way more than I was initially willing to give Memphis credit for. That there was an incredible, scrappy, indie Memphis scene that, again, small but thriving. And when I finally got the courage to start making films and falling in with this group of people. Um, I was so excited to see what Memphis had to offer. There's so much access there is. I think with Los Angeles, it's such, it's just a machine. It's corporations. It is gatekeepers. It is um, difficulty getting access and getting funding. And there's just a, a being jaded is just kind of part of that. And granted, this was in, you know, the mid 2000s. And I don't know how much I know with the industry's really, really changed now just with streaming and um, things have changed a lot. But I would say with Memphis, there's still that delight of you're making a movie. It's like, how yeah. can I be involved? And, and I love that. I loved in the process of making all of my short films. There was just this that feel of like when I was a kid getting the neighborhood together to put on a play. It very much had that same um, sense of I just want to make something. I just want to create. And that has been um, an ongoing delight and thrill of being a filmmaker in Memphis. And Indie Memphis is such an incredible resource and institution for more veteran filmmakers, for up and coming filmmakers, because I know at times the, at, you know, over the past, you know, 10, 15 years, there's been some like, oh, well, it's, it's clicky and there's groups and that's with everything. But I will say that Indie Memphis, their administrators, they have done such incredible work of encouraging people to get involved um, 
Mark Jones, who is a, a local filmmaker, has he has personally endowed um, so many grants for people who, um, like me, who wanted to make a short film but maybe didn't have the funds to make one. He, he's putting money out there um, coupled with Indie Memphis's resources to make movies. And I, I cannot overstate, um, not every city has that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it's... It's just, it's it's huge. It really is. They they work so hard to support filmmakers, and we're so lucky to have them. Um, not to talk about the cons too much, but there we, we like to call those opportunities. So, um, in a perfect world, are there a few kind of opportunities that you wish maybe we could incorporate more? And if any of our listeners, you know, have the same ideas to kind of come together to make those opportunities solvable and make them a reality? That's a good question. Um, and I think at the end of the day, I mean, mo movies are just expensive. It is an expensive medium. Um, there is very much that, oh, well, if you have a phone, you can make a movie. And that's true. Um, but there's, uh, there's only a handful of people that can get away with making a movie on your phone and having that be, you know, in film festivals. Um, there are, there are people who are currently, um, and I don't even want to wade into this because I'm not very familiar with the particulars of like, there are individuals in Memphis that are in the process currently of trying to create studios here. Um, I think that that's the one problem we have with Memphis and with Tennessee is that we just are not competitive with tax benefits, um, for for, you know, movie studios. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a reason that we consistently lose out to, to Georgia, um, to Denver now, Colorado. Um, and that's got to be done on a state level. And I know yeah. our film commission works really, really hard. Yes. Um, and I know, and again, just with young rock filming here, um, I know that has changed things because the executive involved with young rock, um, was like, Hey, he saw Memphis and was like, Oh my God, there's so much potential here. So there's been more work as a result of that. But I think there just still has to be just people in Nashville who, see the benefit of letting Memphis have access to more capital. And that's, that's really at, at the state yeah. level. Absolutely. That's interesting. We've had Lynn um, on here before also to talk about that. And so, yeah, she's definitely, she's a wealth of knowledge and ex yeah. expertise in that. Um, and she would, she would echo that I mm -hmm. would believe. Um, so I'm curious what you have going on for the rest of 2023. Can you tell us ways that our listeners can, follow along with you or get involved in some of the work that you're doing? Oh, sure. Um, so we are, we're hopeful that, um, that, uh, ready fire aim is going to be accessible to more viewers. Um, I think it's probably come to the end of its film festival run, but there is, um, potential for it being streamed because I would love for people to be able to see it. Um, so hopeful for that. Um, the podcast for sure. Yes. Um, we we're, it's a monthly um, podcast, and yes, at the end of the month we put out a new story, and then usually in the middle of the week, um, Nate and I, um, for our Patreon listeners, will will tell each other a ghost story or have like a, a little bonus. So so that's a way you can How fun. You can definitely find me that way. Um, and I'm just always writing. Um, I have written. Um, a bunch of feature screenplays um, that I am hopeful to get produced. Um, again, all parenting at the core. Yes. But, you know, there's a werewolf story. Um, there's there's a lot. So that's all kind of behind the scenes, um, in addition to just the work that I do um, right. at Running Pony with, with the day job. Love it. Love to hear it. Love to see it. I'm excited. I would love for the Kim and Wilson story to be streamed. That would be tremendous. Mm -hmm. That was going to be one of my questions is where, where can we watch it for the people that, uh, which, uh, by the way, the tickets for that screening were gone. Like, like immediately. Yeah. <laughs> I was Melissa's trying to like, call in favors. And <laughs> it was a packed house. It was packed. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so for those of us in Memphis that didn't get to see it, we're hopeful that we get to get to stream it soon. Me as well. I have one final question and then mm -hmm. we're going to do a lightning round. So cool. one thing that we like to ask all of our guests is what does it mean to you to be a Memphian? 
I noticed that any time that I would be at LAX and flying to Memphis, that I, I'm a smiley person and I would smile a lot at people at the airport at LAX. And I'd always get this like, why are you looking at me response? <laughs> and I quickly realized, oh, you can't do that here. You can't smile and make eye contact because people in the city are too busy, too important. Don't look at me. And I remember after several years of living in Los Angeles and appropriately just being in my own, this is before earbuds and being able yes. to really zone out. Um, but I had, I was back in Memphis for a holiday and I'd gone to Walgreens to get something. And I remember, you know, being at the cashier, she was ringing me up and she was talking to me and she was taking her time and smiling at me. And I remember being so irritated <laughs> <laughs> and like, doesn't she know that I have places to go? Why is she being so chatty and smiley? And oh my God, I am such an asshole. <laughs> it like was this like lightning moment of like, what happened to me? And in that moment, I was like, oh, we got it all wrong. We got it so backwards. And I remember going back to LAX on that flight and just smiling at every single person that I could because I was like, no, this is who I am. And this is, you know, I we're supposed to be, it doesn't mean you need to be smiling and connecting with everybody. But to me, Memphis is about community. It is about just reaching out and being, you know, not necessarily hanging with your neighbor. I love my neighbors and I do hang out with my neighbors. Um, but that's the blessing of this being the big city with the small town feeling is that there's just awesome people chose to be here and awesome people is the best thing about Memphis. We would agree. Yeah. The people are our greatest asset. Yeah. I was going to say that I've heard that once or twice. Mm -hmm. uh, my husband is a native Memphian and he he waves like we can't go on a walk. Like he waves at every <laughs> oh, wait, single oh, wait, person. Yeah. Yes, on walks or when I'm in the car, I'm like. I, yeah. I was like, it's. I finally, it's it's ingrained in me now. Um, and then you know we leave, and I'm like, we, people don't wave here, you know. Um, <laughs> but he does it too in the car yeah. on a walk everywhere. So this is our lightning round. Um, the song that is currently stuck in your head, threshold. From the Scott Pilgrim versus the World soundtrack. The movie or film that you could watch on repeat over and over again. Scott Pilgrim versus <laughs> the World. You're going to see a thing here. <laughs> um, your favorite way to decompress or refuel? Uh, hot bath with a book. Okay. Your favorite way to get plugged in in Memphis? Uh, Indie Memphis Film Festival. Why should our listeners go to TEDx 2023? Because there are so many amazing Memphians that have so many incredible stories and you're bound to hear stories that will, that could change you. Favorite project you've worked on? It's like picking a favorite child, I know, but. My ghost podcast. Okay. Love it. That's I like it. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you so much, Melissa, for taking the time to be with us today and to share everything about um, your films, your experience, the film industry here in Memphis, your TED Talk, all the things, parenthood, all of it. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I loved it. It was fun. Bye. Thank you very much, dear listener, for tuning in with us today. We hope that you enjoyed our conversation with Melissa. I know that we did. We learned a lot. And now I really kind of want to go rewatch Poltergeist. Um, and I'm excited for the hopeful streaming of the Kim and Wilson origin story. I'm definitely going to go rewatch Poltergeist. <laughs> I feel like, yeah, the January, like, just give me like a cold, cloudy day. And I'm just like, ugh, I'm there for it. Um, so a few housekeeping notes, dear listener, it is nomination season. So if you would like to nominate for any of our leadership development programs, which include LDI, Fellows, Embark, Accelerate, and Stride, you can head over to newmemphis.org to learn more or follow along with us on social media at the New Memphis. Thanks for having me, Anna. Thanks. Till next week. Bye. This week's episode is made possible by our friends at Independent Bank. You can learn more about them at i-bankonline.com.